Hello. This lecture has been developed for students who are enrolled in an introduction to economics or a lower level macro or micro economics course in college. This lecture is the same lecture I present to my own students in their economic classes, and I share with anyone who desires to learn economics and or needs help passing their own economics courses. Now, I've designed these lectures for non-economic majors, you know, the everyday student who has to take economics but may not be looking to major in this field. However, you still need to pass the course. If this video is helpful to you, then you may want to also check out the companion video for the lecture where I go over common questions and problem solutions that you might encounter in your school work, your quizzes, or your midterm and final exams. This lecture is specifically going to be focusing on the 10 basic principles of economics, which is often a first topic in an economics course. So let's get started. It's always good to start a lecture to make sure that both the instructor and the students sort of have a common definition for things. I mean, let's take a look at the first one, economics. It needs to say there are as many definitions for this word as there are web pages about economics. I mean, there's also this constant debate, is economics a pure science like biology, or is it more of a social science like psychology? For me, I think it's a little bit of both. But there's even some who tend to argue that it's more of an art or a political science. Now, the definition you see here is from one of the most famous economists and well-known. His name is Lionel Robbins. But we could put this definition even simpler and say it's the study of how society manages its scarce resources. This brings us to scarcity. For economists, scarcity is basically the driving factor of most human behavior. Generally, we can't have everything we want at every moment. It's just a fact of life. If given a choice, I'd rather be seeing a play on Broadway right now, maybe Hamilton or some big play that's going on. But I have limited resources. In this case, my resources might be time and money. Based on the scarcity of my time off and based on the scarcity of my money, those will be driving factors of the decisions I make on whether or not I go to New York and spend my time and my money to see this play. We also have to remember that the plays have a scarcity resource of just simply tickets because there are only so many tickets available at a time. All of those will come into play on both price, quantity, and human behavior. Opportunity cost is one that we don't tend to think of much, but economists look at it all the time. This is basically the concept that every time you obtain something, there's something else you didn't obtain that you might have wanted, something that you gave up, and there's a cost to the things that you gave up. So just think of this example. You go down to the local vending machine with your dollar and looking at the different choices, you choose to buy the soda. Now you could have bought a bag of chips, but instead you bought the soda. So the opportunity to buy the chips is the opportunity cost that you gave up. Discussing opportunity costs is going to be throughout pretty much all the economic classes. With marginal change, the big thing to remember is that marginal means the edge. It's a small change. Now, as humans, we often notice big changes to our actions or our plans, but economists, we like to examine these small marginal changes because those small changes are often the things that affect and change our overall behavior patterns. So you go into 7-Eleven to buy a Hershey's bar, but you come out with a Snickers. Economists would want to know what events came into play or what forces had you make this change. And if we can understand those, can we repeat them? Now, there are several different types of economies. For economists, a market economy is one in which there is basically a freedom between buyers and sellers to make decisions. So it's more of a capitalist system. We basically say that there's no central planning in a market economy, as in a communist system. Externalities is one that most people don't tend to talk much about in the real world, but economists, well, we talk about it all the time. What we're talking about here is that there is an effect to a third party to many economic decisions. So let's say that a town has decided it wants to open up a factory or it's allowed a factory to come into town because it's going to bring in more jobs, which will help with the unemployment. And that unemployment will help with bringing more cash into the society. 
that all's well and good except for the fact the factory is also going to bring pollution and there are going to be some people who have nothing to do with the factory and nothing to do with the extra money coming into the system that will get affected by that pollution so the question then comes is what is the effect to the third parties and lastly is inflation now here i just want to make sure that as you hear about inflation within an economics class we're talking about inflation of the whole economy we're not just talking about of a single product or a single industry so we're not talking about that your milk went up in price yes it may have been inflated prices but inflation generally in economics is talking about the whole economy so it's not just your milk that went up in price but also the movie tickets your rent clothing apples everything the overall level of prices in the economy went up let's start looking at these 10 principles the first thing we have to look at is that individuals make decisions and those decisions affect the economy so in our first principle we're really looking at the concept of trade-off i mean it would be really nice if we could have everything at one time however we can't and since we can't we have to make decisions often that means having to trade off one thing we want for something else we want right now you're trading off your time listening to this lecture rather than playing or cooking or watching something else you might even mean trading off your time to study for economics instead of writing a paper for English good for you <laughs> after all you have a limited time time is scarce it is a scarce resource and you have to make trade-offs of what you're going to do with your time now the same concept would also apply to money and even to physical space both of which have limits I mean we can look at this concept in a larger picture in the terms of societies and space a town only has so much room and when there's an empty space the question is is how should that be used this decision often comes down to two concepts efficiency versus equality so let's look at these in the terms of gasoline after all i live in florida and we have hurricanes and sometimes gas becomes a limited resource after a hurricane so a town may look at the gasoline and say well what's the most efficient way to use that gasoline should we give it to the hospital and first responders because we have people who are in trouble and might need to get to the hospital you know should we give some to the heavy equipment that's needed to clear out the roads because if we can't clear the roads we can't do anything or should we give some to the power people because we need power in order to run the houses and we need power because there are some individuals who have medications that have to be refrigerated ah well then do individuals need some gasoline in order to keep their generators going so their medication doesn't go bad so that they don't wind up in the hospital these are questions that we always look at because we have a limited resource and what would be the most efficient and effective use of that particular scarce resource the other concept that we have to look at is equality equality would be the distribution of the gas should it be evenly distributed between all the members of society at this time should a little go here a little go there a little go here and a lot of times these two concepts they basically come into conflict especially when we talk about government policy and the use of a scarce resource there's not always a correct answer there's just maybe a better answer than another and secondly uh, the second principle you might want to say is that to make a decision for trade-offs people must determine what the costs and the benefits of their decisions will be you have to decide if the benefits outweigh the cost so you've decided to go to college because i'm assuming you're not watching this video just for the fun of it at some point you did an analysis maybe it was just internal but you determined that the costs associated going with college such as giving up time with your family the stress of school the financial burden is less than the benefit that you'd gain from earning the degree which could be a higher status a more secure job a nicer house a larger paycheck the larger cost of going to college though is really your time the time you dedicate to school means that you've given up time to earn money or some other benefits such as experiences all that time that you gave up to go to college that's an opportunity cost it could be financial but remember scarcity is not just money 
It could be that you gave up an opportunity to go on a trip with your family because it was finals week or concert with your friend because you had to study for a final. But there are also individuals that may give up college because other opportunities are greater than the cost. Easy one to see is a professional athlete who decides to turn pro and earn millions of dollars instead of finishing college. Or maybe it's somebody who's studying acting and they get a movie in a, a part in a movie and decide that the part in the movie is of more benefit to them than finishing their college education. Now, we might get a sticker from you, but economists assume that most people are what they call rational people. That people are trying to do the best they can through some sort of a systematic and purposeful actions based on the opportunities that are available to them to achieve their individual goals. And remember that most decisions that you're making, they really aren't just pure black and white. They have shades of gray. In many cases, you're making decisions so quickly because you've made them so many times before, you've already eliminated a lot of the gray. But you do tend to adjust your decision making based on the opportunities around you and your goals. Now, a simple example is that you're hungry on the way home. You see a fast food restaurant and you think, hey, I could grab something small on the way home, or maybe I should wait till I get home. Let's say you grab something on the way home. You've made a small change in your plan or what's called a marginal change. So in economics, the marginal change is used to designate that small incremental modification to that existing plan to go home and have some food at home. Rational people will look at the marginal benefits and the marginal cost when making that decision. So in our example, the person weighed if reducing their hunger now, giving up some time and some money, was more beneficial than waiting to reduce their hunger at home, which would maybe cost less and get them faster at the couch. A, a rational decision maker will always take the action if and only if the action of the marginal benefit exceeds that of the marginal cost. So basically, I have to get more out of the decision I'm going to make than what it might cost me to make that action. And the last one in this group of four is incentives. Let's make sure we have the same thoughts here though. An incentive is something, a stimulus let's say, that persuades a person to action. The most common incentives are generally offered through some sort of reward or punishments, but there are so many other types of incentives. Now, an economist states that rational people will make decisions based on the incentives they have determined will occur after they've done that analysis of cost and benefit. Remember, it's not always a big analysis that you're doing. Earlier, we talked about candy bars. So you were at the local convenience store and you did a quick cost and benefit analysis of the different snack items you see. Do you want sweet, crunchy, salty, or creamy? You just did a cost and benefit analysis. You will respond to the incentives you are presented, such as the sizes, the prices, the convenience, the items that are actually available. The incentives play a big part also in communicating desires. So in this case, perhaps the store desires for you to buy some Snickers bars. So they've reduced the price of those. You may have gone in for the Hershey bar, but the price incentivized you to buy the Snickers bar and you came out with that instead. There was that small marginal change. Price made a change in your action. Incentives play also a big part in communicating desires of policy change when it comes to both private businesses and government agencies. You know, a company may want to save money by automating the recording of workers' time. Knowing that people generally don't like change, a company will talk about the incentives that the employee will get, basically the benefits, such as clocking in from their phones and being so much more convenient. A government agency may desire to make change to a law that they see as a public good. So we can think about automobiles and seatbelts. Ralph Nader basically went into Congress, talked a great deal about it. He basically was incentivizing that having safety belts would reduce potential deaths. We never really talked about perhaps the higher cost of the car. But people became incentivized to want seatbelts and to pay a little extra for the car because it could reduce their chance of dying in a car accident. These are the first four. Let's take a look at the next three next. We just looked at individuals' decision making, but those decisions often have an effect on others. So the next three principles examine the interaction between people and the effects on the economy. 
You know, these days when people hear the word trade, many think of big international deals between countries. But trade is an everyday action that takes place within a household, you know, between people and businesses, and yes, large international trade agreements. But human bartering was the significant development of humankind. It allows societies to grow and to thrive. I grow corn, you make pots, we trade, we're both significantly better off. Today, agricultural products and household goods still tend to be among the most popular items traded between societies. We can really see trade having huge effects on societies about the year 3000 BC, when metal began to get traded, specifically metals needed to make bronze. This was an all important trading between societies as the Bronze Age began to emerge. Societies that had metal saw huge economic growths. Those who received metal made huge leaps and bounds as far as how to use bronze and how to employ it within agriculture and within household goods. You know, trade has allowed individuals, societies, and countries to specialize in what they do best. And this creates efficiencies that was discussed in principle one. Now here's a hint for you. The word market has so many different meanings from a place where people do trade to the promotion of a product or idea. I market something. As a student, your task is to determine the use of the word market when reviewing materials on exams or in classes. Now, often the word market is linked to a second word that will tell you which type of market or in which way this word is being used. I mean, I checked out the current economic textbook I have in the index, and there are over a different dozen references to markets. So for principle six, though, this is a specific market, in this case, market economies. This is an organized system where decisions about economics, activities of society is made between businesses and households not by a centralized government, such as a communist system, which is called a centralized system. Unlike a centralized system, where a governing body decides what will be made, how it will be made, where it will be made, even who will make it. In a market economy, businesses, big and small, make those decisions, and households decide how to spend their scarce resources, such as time, employment, and money. Household and firms come together in a marketplace. Now, some of these are physical locations like a grocery store, but some are intangible locations such as the internet to make these trades. Most of these trades are guided by basically price and self-interest. Just because a firm may offer a wonderfully made snowboard doesn't mean that it's in my self-interest living on the beach in Florida to obtain a snowboard. Now, if that firm makes a surfboard, it could be in my self-interest to trade my travel time, my money, and other opportunity costs to obtain that item. Now, this brings us to one of the most famous names in economics, and one that's almost in every economic discussion when we talk about the principles of economics, and that is a gentleman named Adam Smith. He basically created this concept called the invisible hand back in 1776. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail about Adam Smith's theories. That's a whole lecture in itself. But his basic argument is that humans are driven by our own self-interest, and this results in an overall society benefit. This is because the ability for a free society to produce items that satisfy self-interest will produce and exchange goods that grow wealth of a society or nation. He said basically that market economies offer an invisible hand, an unseen force to all those who participate. Which brings us to government. First, you need to understand that price of a product in the market economy is set between the buyer and the seller. Both the buyer and the seller need to come to some type of agreement on the price where the buyer will purchase and the seller will produce. Now, we'll look more at this when we get into supply and demand. However, love them or hate them, governments are needed to keep society's economies moving forward. The government's role in society, in part, is to make the invisible hand possible. The enforcement of the rules of societies most often fall to governments, whether it's policing, enforcement agencies, or the courts. These institutions maintain a concept called property rights. 
the right of a person to own and control scarce resources. The argument of how much a government should have control over these rights is for another time and lecture. For economics, a lack of government enforcement of rules tends to lead to a breakdown of property rights and ultimately a breakdown of a market economy. If as a farmer, I bought my apples to a market where people just came and took the apples without paying them, and there was no enforcement of this rule for paying for apples, then either I'm not going back to that market and that society loses that scarce resource or moving to another market and that society gains a scarce resource. Or thirdly, I'm gonna change the product and now all societies lose that scarce resource. Remember back in principle one, I introduced efficiencies and equality. Governments create policies aimed to either enlarge the economy or to change how the pie is divided based on the need of society. Yes, I know governments often do not do this well and they may not get the balance right, but it is the role of the government to look at societies as a whole when it comes to efficiency and equality of a society. There is also another concept and that's externalities that come into play. This is basically a side effect of an economic decision on a third party. So we can think of it this way. We talked about the fact that there could be a company that's coming into town and the government has decided that it would be a good thing for this factory to come into town because it would increase basically employment in town, which isn't having maybe such great employment right now. However, there's gonna be air pollution created by this factory. So now the question is, is the economic benefit that we're going to receive from this factory going to outweigh basically the costs of the possible health problems that people will have from the factory? And these health problems are not gonna be directly for the people who work in the factory or benefit from the factory. It could be everybody within the society. Now we'll cover this topic in more depth in future lectures. But for now, in your notes, I also want you to write that extremities can lead to market failures along with market power. Now, market power is where a small group or an individual has excessive powers to set a market price. When this happens, it could be a monopoly or an oligopoly, but basically them having that power can really affect the economy. A lot of times we look at this when we talk about drug companies and pharmaceutical companies who have the right to make certain products and they have a lot of control over price, which has a big difference on whether or not somebody can afford their medication. So we only have three more to go and we'll take a look at those in a moment. Our last three principles focus on the big picture, how society's economies work. Productivity is determined in economics by measuring how much product or service is produced from each unit of labor. Now you may want to think of a unit of labor is what a person does and in a way it is, but a unit of labor is total labor needed to produce one item. As an example, let's say a firm makes surfboards and it finds it takes three employees 10 hours each to make surfboards. Then the unit of labor is 30 hours per surfboard. Now this boss goes out and buys some new equipment, which reduces the unit of labor to 15 hours per surfboard. However, the employees are still working 30 hours totally each week. This means the firm can now make two surfboards in the same 30 hours. This is an increase in productivity because the firm has increased the number of surfboards it's making in the same 30 hours. What economists have found is that as a firm or society increases productivity, that is directly related to an increase in standard of living for the people of that society. Higher standards of living is linked to increase in nutrition, healthcare, and longer lives. In societies where workers are less productive, we tend to see a lower standard of living than societies where workers are more productive. While this principle looking at societies as a whole, you can also see this in your own life. Each day you get 24 hours to be productive. Some days you're more productive than others. So let's say today you get up, your room is clean, the laundry is done, the dishes are washed, it's all done by 11. You've increased your productivity that day because generally this takes you till two. 
Now, this will lead to a higher standard of living in your home because you've got a cleaner home for a longer period of time that day. But don't forget that just because a society may not have good productivity does not mean that they are lazy or weak in any way. They could lack the tools or the advancement or the knowledge to be more productive. After all, as we've said before, you can be more productive with a tractor in tilling a field than you can with a mule tilling a field. Now, some prices tend to fluctuate almost daily, such as gasoline or fruit. Those changes in price is not inflation. It might be an inflated price, but inflation is when almost all prices in society rise. So it's not just the gas and fruit, but also shirts, sneakers, dinner out, movies and such. As prices rise, people's income remains the same. Then each person has less they can purchase. Basically, they have a scarcer resource that's available to the overall economy. So let's make this assumption that you make $100 a week. Hopefully you have more, but let's just do 100 because it's an easy number. From that, you need $50 to pay each week for your housing and $20 for bills. A total of $70 is already spoken for. This gives you $30 to go spend on other things, whatever you like, entertainment. But remember, money is limited. You only have $100 each week and you only have $30 of that to go out and spend for fun. Inflation hits. You get $100, but now your housing costs you $55 and your bills are going to cost you $25 for a total of $80. Your income did not go up, but now you only have $20 to spend on other things. So you're going to have to give something up because you have $10 less to spend out in the economy. And you've decided that you're going to give up, let's say, dining out on Friday nights. Now, this can begin to affect the whole economy because it probably will not just be you not going out to dinner on Friday nights, but others as well, because all prices have increased, which means that the restaurants that you usually go to will have less business. And with less business, they may need less employees. Now there's more people out of work. You begin to get the picture. One thing happens to another, which happens to another. Now something is going to have to change or there could be total market failure and a downward plunge in society's economy and thus a downward plunge in the standard of living. Now there could be several reasons for inflation, but the big picture generally is the quantity of money that a government allows in circulation. So make that as a note, the quantity of money that government allows in circulation tends to be related directly to inflation. The more physical money there out there, the less valuable each piece of money is worth. The value of money falls. It raises prices in the long run. Which then sort of brings us to the last one, because it might seem that increasing the money supply appears to be a bad thing because it can cause inflation. But that's in the long term. In the short term, increasing the money supply can have a very beneficial effect on the economy. Increasing what each person in society has to spend can stimulate demand for goods and services, which can lead to an increase in employment and an increase in firm spending. Also, more employment generally means that firms will have to pay more to attract and keep employees, raising employees' income and again increasing the money supply. But there's always the struggle between the short term and the long term effects of economic policy. Do you risk inflation in the long run or do you step in with short term relief by increasing the amount of money available, which will reduce unemployment and perhaps stimulate economic growth? Again, here are the 10 basic principles to economics. You'll find as you move through your courses that these basic principles will be explored in greater depth and detail. Almost all economics discussions will relate back to one or more of these basic concepts. Now, do remember that while I have presented these 10 principles, your own instructor might have slightly different names for each, and some instructors will even combine them so there's a few less principles to learn. Always refer back to your own textbook and class material. Remember to check out the companion video to this lecture where I review the most common types of questions you could have on your homework, quizzes, or exams. I'll also review the few math-based questions from these principles you could be asked to solve. Check it out. Till next time, keep learning.